1, on February 1, 2022, I 1, on February Mass Massachusetts State Police Christopher S. Mason Colonel Superintendent R. Scott Warmington Deputy Superintendent 2. Detective Lieutenant Brian P. Tully, Commanding Norfolk SPDU From Trooper Kathleen M. Prince No. 2791, Norfolk County SPDU Subject, McCabe, Jennifer D.O.B. 0214-1976 Case, 2022-112-0033. 1. On February 1, 2022, I, along with Trooper Connor Keefe, went to 12, Country Lane in Canton to speak to Jennifer McCabe concerning the investigation into the death of John O'Keefe on January 29. 2022, the following is a summary of what Ms. McCabe told us. 2. Ms. McCabe stated that on Friday, January 28, 2022, she and her husband, Matt McCabe, had been at the waterfall in Canton. Jen said that John and Karen came into the waterfall around 11 p.m. Jen said that she knows John O'Keefe because her daughter and John O'Keefe's niece, Kaylee, are friends. She said that she had come to know Karen through John because the two were dating. Jen said that John had encouraged Jen and Karen to become friendly because Jen has multiple sclerosis and Karen had also been diagnosed with MS. John and Karen had been at C.F. McCarthy's before. They came into the waterfall. Jen noticed that Karen had a mixed drink in a clear glass in her hand that she had brought over from C.F. McCarthy's. 3. At the end of the evening, Jen said that she and her husband were planning to go to her sister's house because it was her nephew's birthday. Jen said that she asked Karen and John if they wanted to come along and they said that they would. The Alberts live at 34, Fairview Road. Jen said that John had texted her at 12.14 a.m. to get the address. Jen said that she spoke with John on the phone to explain where the house is. She said that she remembers providing him with directions, specifically telling him to drive past Bella's house on the right. Jen said that John would know where Bella lives, as she is a friend of Kaylee. 4. Jen said that while she was at the house, someone said that there was a car outside. Jen looked out the front door of the house and saw the car. She assumed it was John and Karen. She said that she did not notice what kind of car it was. Jen said that she is not good at identifying cars and was not able to provide a description of the car. She noticed that the vehicle was facing in the opposite direction of how it would have been if they had followed the directions provided earlier. Jen then texted John at 12.21 a.m., here? She texted John again at 12.31 a.m. and told him to pull behind her vehicle. She looked out the window a little while later and noticed that the car was further away from the house closer to the neighbor. At 12.40 a.m. she texted again and said, Hello, where are you? There was no response from John. Jen said that her phone shows a call from her phone to John around that time but she thinks that she dialed him by accident when she was putting her phone in and out of her pants pocket. The next time that she looked out the window, the car was gone. She did not think anything of it and thought that they just decided not to come in. Jen said that she and her husband were at the house from around 11.45 a.m. to about 1.30 a.m. She said that she and her husband drove two of her nephew's friends home and then they went home. 5. The following morning, Jen got a call from Kaylee. Kaylee said, Hi Jen, Karen needs to talk to you. Karen got on the phone and was yelling, John never came home. Karen told Jen that she left him at the waterfall. Jen thought that perhaps he was with a friend. Jen said that she checked with Julie Albert to see if he had gone to their house. Jen explained to Karen that she did not leave him at the waterfall because they were outside Jen McCabe's sister's house after the waterfall. Karen then told Jen that when she got home John was not with her. Jen began to think of other friends that John might have ended up going to such as Tom Beatty but he was not there either. 
Karen was telling Jen that she had not planned to stay at John's house that night and that John would not have stayed out all night leaving Kaylee home alone overnight. At some point while they were talking on the phone, Karen got into her car and started driving. Jen said. That Karen was hysterical screaming. Karen drove to Jen's house. 6. Jen said that when Karen showed up at her house around 5.30 a.m., she went outside and started to drive Karen's car to John's house. She said that they got to John's house around 5.45 a.m. Shortly after, Carrie arrived. They looked in John's house to make sure he was not there. The three decided to all get into one vehicle to look for him. They took Carrie's car. Jen said that Karen was saying things like, could I have hit him? Look at the crack in my taillight. There is a crack in it. Jen said that she did notice damage to the taillight. Jen said that Karen was so hysterical and was saying so many things that Jen did not think that Karen actually hit him. Karen was also saying things about him possibly being with old girlfriends. 7. Jen said that they probably got on the road around 5.53 a.m. to go to look for John. Carrie was driving, Karen was in the back and Jen was in the passenger seat. They pulled down to Fairview from Chapman Street. Jen said that as they were approaching the 34 Fairview house, Karen said, pull the fucking car over. There he is. Jen said that she did not notice him but Karen did. Carrie stopped in the middle of the road and Karen jumped out of the car and went to him. Jen said that John was in the area of where she had last seen the vehicle night prior. Jen said that he was on the lawn. There was a coating of about six inches of snow on him. Karen threw herself on top of him. He was lying on his back and his phone was on the ground underneath him. Jen said that she called 911. They attempted CPR and then the ambulance and police arrived. Jen said that Karen was very hysterical. She was asking people if she had hit him. Karen was told to sit in a car. Jen went over to Karen when she was in the car. Jen observed Karen to have blood on her hands and face. Karen was holding her hands up and was saying, I have my period. Jen said that she told Karen that was not her blood that it was John's blood from them doing CPR. Jen also stated that while her and Karen were in the back of the car, Karen was yelling and screaming one moment and then completely calm the next. Jen said that they prayed the Our Father together. Karen then immediately yelled at Jen two times to Google. How long do you have to be left outside to die from hypothermia? Jen was unsure if she Karen was brought from the scene by ambulance to the hospital. 8. Jen was asked about what Karen and John were like when they were at the water club. She said that she did not notice them fighting. She has known them to be together as a couple for about two years and to her knowledge, they loved each other. She said that she did not think that there were any issues between them. Jen said that the only thing that she can think of is once Karen made a comment that if there were not any kids, they would not have anything to fight over. Jen told Karen that was very normal. Jen was asked about their level of intoxication and she said that they were both drinking but did not appear to be drunk. Respectfully submitted. Trooper Kathleen M. Prince, Number 2791. Norfolk County SPDU Massachusetts State Police. May 22, 2023. Kevin J. Reddington Attorney at Law 1342, Belmont Street, Brockton, Massachusetts, 02301583-4289-580-6186. Norfolk, S.S. Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Dedham Superior Court No. 2282 CR 00111. Commonwealth v. Karen Reed. Memorandum IIN Supportive Motion to Quash Subpoena Served on Jennifer McCabe, Government Witness. Rule 17 of the Massachusetts Rules of Criminal Procedure allows for the 
production of documentary evidence and objects such as books, papers, documents and other objects designated therein. A summons so issued may command the person to produce the above. The court has the inherent jurisdiction under Rule 17 to quash or modify the summons if compliance would be unreasonable or oppressive or used to subvert the provisions of Rule 17. The rule allows the court to direct that papers, books, documents or objects so designated be produced, inspected or copied. The court is well aware of the standard to balance the defendant's right to a fair trial with that of the Commonwealth's right to prevent unnecessary and unwarranted harassment of government. Witnesses Commonwealth v. Lamprin, 441 Mass. 265, Commonwealth v. Lamb, 444 Mass. 224, the burden is on the defense to show that the subpoena is issued in good faith with specificity as to what is sought based upon specific articulable facts and does not constitute a fishing expedition. In this case, the Rule 17 practice has been extensively litigated by both sides. The factual predicate of the offense as rebutted by the government has been scrutinized, rehashed and argued repeatedly. The defense obtained the appropriate items as directed by the court order and the cell records were produced for analysis by both sides. The defense has attempted to broaden its Rule 17 net but to no avail. By serving Jennifer McCabe with a general subpoena to testify further as to the Rule 17 materials already produced it is readily apparent that the subpoena is intended to harass, intimidate and embarrass the government witness all while seeking to expand the record on a generic Rule 17 motion to a full-blown evidentiary hearing which would be apparently freewheeling and subject only to the court's ability to monitor the scope and range of questioning. Rule 17 does not contemplate oral testimony let alone subpoenaing witnesses subject to unfettered cross-examination by a hostile party. A stunning analogy to the defendant's effort to subpoena government witness Jennifer McCabe is tantamount to the defense filing a Rule 17 for a sexual assault victim's electronic media once produced and analyzed by both sides yet the defense seeks to call the complaining witness to give. Live testimony. Clearly not permitted. The subpoena should be quashed as being vexatious and harassing and calculated to embarrass and intimidate government witnesses. The judge is vested with wide discretion to quash or modify subpoenas to ensure witnesses are not harassed or intimidated. United States v. Hardy, 224 F3752, 8th Circle. 2000, United States v. Hughes, 895 F8135, United States v. Romeri, 670 F2702, Cert. Den. 459 U.S. 1035. A complainant or witness should not be forced to retain counsel or appear before a court in order to challenge on the basis of a partial view of the case potentially impermissible examination of her personal effects and the records of her personal interactions. See State v. DeCaro, 725A2800, CT. 2000, see also Commonwealth v. Bugass, 2003 Lexus Mass. App, 1000, Commonwealth v. Caceres, 63 Mass. App, CT 747. Kevin J. Reddington. Attorney at Law 1342, Belmont Street, Brockton, Massachusetts, 02301583, 4280580, 618-0, Jennifer McCabe By her attorney Kevin J. Reddington Commonwealth v. Karen Reed Affidavit in support of motion to quash subpoena I, Kevin J. Reddington, ESQ, being first duly sworn, depose and say that 1. I am an attorney duly licensed to practice law in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts 2. I represent Jennifer McCabe. 3. Mrs. McCabe is a witness for the government in the homicide indictment of Commonwealth v. Karen Redd as above captioned. 4. 
Jennifer McCabe cooperated as a civilian witness with the investigators, district. Attorney and grand jury at all stages as requested. 5. Mrs. McCabe is a mother and housewife who lives in Canton, Massachusetts. 6. Mrs. McCabe has, at all times, acted consistent with her obligations as a citizen to provide information deemed relevant to the charges against Karen Redd. 7. Defense counsel has litigated and lost Rule 17 motions. The witness, McCabe, has provided her cell phone which has been examined and re-examined by the prosecution and defense. 8. Inexplicably, the defense has not served her with a general subpoena to testify in a continuation of the Rule 17 motion filed by the defense. 9. There is no legal basis for this subpoena. The defense has no right to try and subvert. 10. The subpoena is vexatious and harassing and does not stand on any valid legal framework. It is clearly calculated to intimidate and harass the witness and the subpoena should be quashed. Signed under the pains and penalties of perjury this 22nd day of May, 2023.